Welcome to the lecture on the first meditation of René Descartes' Meditations on First Philosophy. I'm Andrew Chapman, and in this lecture, we'll investigate the epistemological questions, what can we know and what can we doubt, and seeing the relationship between knowledge, doubt, justification, belief, and certainty. Says Descartes, It is some years now since I realized how many false opinions I had accepted as true from childhood onwards, and that whatever I had since built on such shaky foundations could only be highly doubtful. Hence, I saw that at some stage in my life, the whole structure would have to be utterly demolished, and that I should have to begin again from the bottom up if I wished to construct something lasting and unshakable in the sciences. But this seemed to be a massive task, and so I postponed it until I had reached the age when one is as fit as one will ever be to master the various disciplines. Hence, I have delayed so long that now I should be at fault if I used up in deliberating the time that is left for acting. The moment has come, and so today I have discharged my mind from all its cares and have carved out a space of untroubled leisure. I have withdrawn into seclusion and shall at last be able to devote myself seriously and without encumbrance to the task of destroying all my former opinions. In this quotation, Descartes is laying out his goal as well as his methodology, as well as his motivation for trying to achieve his goal and uh, for the me methodology that he's using in trying to achieve that goal. And as we go on in the lecture, I'll become more explicit about the goal Descartes' methodology and his motivation for that goal and that methodology. But notice here, briefly and in overview, what Descartes is saying. If you build your beliefs on falsehoods, there's a good chance that there will be something wrong with those beliefs. And so, if you hope to achieve anything systematic in the sciences, in generalized knowledge of the way the world is, then you should make sure that the foundations of your beliefs are true, that they're grounded in just ways of knowing about the way the world is. However, says Descartes, a lot of our beliefs we have not because we've come to them given any sort of rational investigative process, but because we accepted these beliefs from childhood onward. And so we've been carrying along beliefs that just may not be justified, may be false. And so at some point we need to sit down, clear our minds, and try consciously to evaluate each one of our beliefs see what the justification is for those beliefs if we're ever going to make any progress in knowing anything about the way the world is. Descartes' project is primarily epistemological here. Epistemology is one of the central sub-disciplines of philosophy, and it's important for this lecture as we go on for us to understand what epistemology is. Epistemologists, people who study epistemology, are concerned primarily with knowledge, justification, and belief. So some of the central questions asked by epistemologists are, what is the nature of knowledge? That is, what's the essence of knowledge? What would it take to know something? What's the definition of knowledge such that all and only pieces of knowledge fall under that definition. What can be known? Notice that while the first question is asking about the nature of knowledge, the second question is asking about particular things that can be known or particular classes of things that can be known. What's the nature of justification? 
What's the definition of justification such that all and only pieces of justification follow, fall under that definition? What is it that we can be justified in believing? Similar to questions 1 and 2, questions 3 and 4 talk in turn about the nature of something and then about particular instances of that thing. What is the nature of belief? When we believe things, what does that mean? What are we doing when we believe? And under what conditions is belief appropriate? Now, of course, there are many other questions that epistemologists ask and try to provide answers to, but these are some of the central questions that have guided the field of epistemology ever since about 2,500 years ago when it was inaugurated in Plato's dialogue, the Theotetus, and right up till today. So epistemology is concerned primarily with the knower, that is, the subject or the person, and only secondarily with the things known, that is, the world or the objects of knowledge. So if somebody tells you they're an epistemologist, or if you're doing epistemology, then you know that the central thing that's being talked about is something with a mind, something that can investigate, something that can know. Now, what's investigated and what's known is things about the world, of course, but epistemology can't be done without first looking at what it is to be a subject of belief, of justification, of knowledge. So all epistemological questions, all epistemological answers will involve a subject, a person, a knower. Now that we've looked at these preliminaries, let's look at Descartes' methodology in the first meditation. Descartes says, prudence dictates that we should never fully trust those who have deceived us even once. Now, Descartes doesn't mean here that you can't put some trust in things that have deceived you in the past. What he's saying is that you can never get certainty out of something that you know is capable of deceiving you. Now, Descartes' goal in the meditations, especially in the first meditation, is to, as much as is possible, believe only true things. So notice that there is a connection between that quotation and between Descartes' goal. If the goal is to believe only true things, then we should be very suspicious of things that have deceived us even once. And Descartes' plan of attack in the meditations is this. First, enumerate all the different sources of justification. Now, the reason that Descartes is concerned with sources of justification rather than individually justified things is that he notices that if he's going to evaluate all of his beliefs, it'll take him probably an infinite amount of time to go through each one of them. So, he says, what we can do is look at the individual sources of belief, the large classes of things that are justified under particular sources of justification, and we can see whether a source of justification is reliable or not, whether it's deceived us even once or not. That'll allow us to do a great amount of work relatively quickly. Second step in Descartes' plan, determine which of these sources of justification can be deceptive and which can't, and then finally, if a source of justification can be deceptive, then doubt the truth of any purported knowledge or belief that's grounded in that source of justification. So, just to give an analogy here. If you have two different bakers who bake cupcakes, one of them has occasionally poisoned her cupcakes and the other has never poisoned her cupcakes. Even if neither of the cupcakes have poison in them this time, if you know that somebody has poisoned cupcakes in the past, maybe you shouldn't eat their cupcakes ever 
if you have some alternate source of cupcakes. Let's look very briefly at the notions of perception and deception and the relationship between the two of them. Now when I talk about perception here, I'm talking very broadly about sources of justification. Sometimes we use perception just to mean something like sight. Here I'm being much more broad than that, and as we'll see momentarily, I'll break down the sources of justification into four different broad categories, but here I just want to talk about uh, justificational sources or perception broadly. Perceptual deception is what happens when things appear to be some way that they aren't actually. When the way things appear to us is just wrong. Now, there are two general types of perceptual deception. The first, quotidian deception, are just standard and momentary cases of misperceiving and miscalculation. The second sort is radical perceptual deception, unusual, intense, and universal cases of misperceiving and miscalculation. And these are usually due to systematic perceptual breakdown or external influence on us by some source of interference. So here are a couple of examples of quotidian deception. We're all familiar with the case of something appearing bent in water, even if it's not actually bent, because of how light refracts. So as you see in this example, the straw appears to be bent or even broken, even though it's not. This is a case of quotidian deception because it's momentary. Nothing has broken down in our perceptual apparatus. We're getting something wrong in our perception, but it's not universal, systematic. Another case of quotidian deception, a mirage on a hot day in a desert. It appears that there's water out at the end of the horizon, but there isn't any water there. It appears that there's water here because of something momentary in the way that light is interacting with the heat coming off of the ground. But nothing has systematically broken down. Now, what are cases of universal, systematic breakdown involved in radical deception? Well, think of somebody who, for example, is undergoing uh, a sort of psychosis, somebody who's hallucinating, somebody who's having a, uh, an intense delusion. These are all cases of radical perceptual deception. And there's no better example of radical perceptual deception than the one that's been given to us in the 1999 movie, The Matrix. So I'll play you um, a, a clip from that in which we are given an example of radical perceptual deception. You wanted to know what The Matrix is, Neo? Trinity. Try to relax. This will feel a little weird. This is the construct. It's our loading program. We can load anything from clothing to equipment weapons, training simulations, anything we need. Right now, we're inside a computer program? Is it really so hard to believe? Your clothes are different, the plugs in your arms and head are gone. Your hair has changed. 
Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. It is the mental projection of your digital self. This... This isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. This is the world that you know. The world as it was at the end of the 20th century. It exists now only as part of a neural interactive simulation that we call the matrix. You've been living in a dream world, Neo. This is the world as it exists today. For certain is that at some point in the early 21st century all of mankind was united in celebration we marveled at our own magnificence as we gave birth to ai ai you mean artificial intelligence a singular consciousness that spawned an entire race of machines we don't know who struck first us or them but we know that it was us that scorched the sky at the time, they were dependent on solar power, and it was believed that they would be unable to survive without an energy source as abundant as the sun. Throughout human history, we have been dependent on machines to survive. Fate, it seems, is not without a sense of irony. The human body generates more bioelectricity than a 120-volt battery and over 25,000 BTUs of body heat. Combined with a form of fusion, the machines had found all the energy they would ever need. There are fields, endless fields, where human beings are no longer born. We are grown. For the longest time, I wouldn't believe it. And then I saw the fields with my own eyes. Watched them liquefy the dead so they could be fed intravenously to the living. And standing there, facing the pure, horrifying precision, I came to realize the obviousness of the truth. What is the Matrix? Control. The Matrix is a computer-generated dream world built to keep us under control in order to change a human being into this. No. I don't believe it. It's not possible. I didn't say it would be easy, Neo. I just said it would be the truth. Stop! Let me out! Let me out! I want out! Easy, Neo. Easy. Take this hand. Don't touch me. Get away from me. Stay away from me. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. It's gonna pop. Breathe, Neo. Just breathe. Notice how many different epistemological issues are implicated in that short clip. We have issues about what reality is, what we can possibly be justified in believing, and what justification looks at, what we should believe, what we do believe, how our beliefs are related to justification and reality, and finally, what we can know and how knowledge is related to justification, belief, and reality. 
in that clip, Neo, the main character, learns that what he had taken for so long to be the real world, the actual world, was nothing but a computer-generated dream world. It was a sort of virtual reality that Neo didn't realize that he was in. So his beliefs were false, but not just his beliefs about the way the world acted, the way the world actually was, but further his beliefs about who he was, what he was, what mattered, whether he was free. All of these beliefs were based on his justification. His justification, all of it, was illusory. He was giving him a picture of reality that was false. And so the things that he took himself to know weren't actually things that he knew. His justification was systematically deceiving him. Now, one of the questions, the central question, in fact, that Descartes is asking in the meditations, in the first meditation especially, is, is it possible that when we go about the world, we are systematically deceived like that? And if it is possible, what does that say about belief, about knowledge, about what we can be justified in doing, in believing? So since we'll be using these terms, reality, justification, belief, and knowledge, let's very quickly define each one of them. Reality is the way the world actually is, independent of what anyone thinks about it. Now, if you're saying, well, how could we possibly know that, or who's to say what reality is, notice that reality has nothing to do with you or with me, what we can know, what people say about it. Reality just is the way the world is. Our knowledge, claims we make about reality, those are separate things that we hope are influenced by reality, by the way the world actually is, but maybe they aren't. And that's the question that we're asking here. It's very important not to get reality confused with what we think reality is, how we've interpreted reality, how people have interpreted reality in the past. Reality is what we are aiming at when we believe things, but we don't create reality by believing things. Justification is the link between reality and the subject. Justification is what tells the subject about reality. It's the window into reality, and when justification is valuable, that's because the justification is somewhat accurate. When justification isn't valuable, that's because there's something wrong with the justification. It's systematically deceiving us. Belief is the cognitive pro-attitude subjects take toward reality. Now that sounds sort of complicated, although I've just used some technical terms there to be precise. Cognitive here meaning the contentful or proposition-related mental state, and pro-attitude meaning positive rather than negative. We take it to be that way rather than take it to be the opposite of that way. So to believe is to take reality to be a certain way. If I believe something, I think it's true. If I believe that it's snowing outside, for example, I think that it's true that it's snowing outside. And knowledge is a very special sort of non-lucky justified true belief. If I know something, then I believe it. If I know something, then I'm justified in believing it. And if I know something, then it's true. Now, sometimes I might think I know something and be wrong. But if I, in fact, succeed at knowing something, that's because I've got justification and truth for the belief that I have. And that justification and truth I possess non-luckily. Now, there are a few different sources of justification that epistemologists talk about, and you saw Descartes mention these 
in the first meditation. One source of justification that we have is testimony. Testimony is um, reports from other people about the way the world actually is. These reports can come in the form of utterances, or they can come in the form of audio recordings or lectures like the one that you're listening to right now. They can come in the form of written sentences that we read in a book. So all of these are sources of testimony that come from one person to another. A second sort of justification is memory, memorial justification, that comes to us from our own stored mental states. Now, uh, cognitive psychologists, neuroscientists have told us quite a bit about how memory functions in recent years and decades. Uh, the thought is that memory is the sort of thing that we can call up and that is partially recreated on the spot. If I'm trying to figure out who the 16th president of the United States was, for example, I appeal to my memory and I think, it's Abraham Lincoln. I believed that in the past. I have no reason to think that something's gone wrong here, so uh, I'm justified in believing that Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president of the United States. Now, maybe my memory came from, in part, testimony. Maybe my fourth grade teacher told me, a form of testimony, that Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president of the United States. I believed her. I formed a memory about that, and that's why I have that memory. So sources of justification can combine and can influence each other. A main source of justification, one that uh, is apparent to us, that is forceful in the manifest world, is sensation. We have a number of different senses. We have the five what are known as Aristotelian senses, sight, taste, smell, hearing, and touch. But we also have a number of other senses. For example, pain is a sense that isn't just related to touch. You have a sense of whether you're accelerating or decelerating. You have a sense of your body's spatial relation to itself. So you know if your arms are up above your head or are behind your back. All of these are different senses, and they're different ways that we can know about the world, different sources of justification. And finally, rational intuition. Rational intuition is the way that we can know about necessary truths, for example, the truths of logic or mathematics, or um, even, for example, ethical or political truths about what ought to be the case. Now, as I've said, these sources of justification can commingle. Sometimes one of them can override another one of them. If somebody tells me something, but I have a memory that that's false, testimony and memory might be interacting. Or if, for example, I take some drug and uh, then I have the sensation that the walls are melting uh, melting in on themselves. Um, I might have the memory of taking the drug, so the memory um, might override the sensation. So uh, these are all just different sources. And one of Descartes' projects here, one of the ways of, of, of laying out one of his projects, is that he's questioning these different sources of justification in terms of their veridicality in terms of their ability to tell us true things or to deceive us. The main topic of the first meditation, then, is what's known as epistemological skepticism. Those are both big terms, but you'll see that uh, they're just uh, big because they're trying to be precise. Epistemological you already recognize that term, surely. That's uh, of or pertaining to epistemology, the term that we've already outlined. Skepticism in epistemology is the position that some epistemological goal that we might have is unattainable. And there are a number of different epistemological goals, but the two that are generally talked about in reference to skepticism are our goals of becoming justified in believing things or our goal of knowing certain things. 
Justification skepticism, then, is the position that justification is unattainable, and knowledge skepticism is the position that knowledge is unattainable. So both justification and knowledge skepticism are forms of epistemological skepticism. And it's important to recognize that skepticism of both of these sorts comes in both restricted and universal forms. So someone might think that justification only of some sorts is unattainable, while justification of other sorts is attainable. Or they might think that all justification is unattainable. Similarly, somebody might think that knowledge of some sorts is unattainable, while other sorts of knowledge is perfectly well attainable. Or they might think that knowledge at all, knowledge of all sorts, is unattainable. Now, it's important to recognize a distinction here between skepticism and just plain being wrong. Epistemological skepticism and just plain being wrong, those are two separate things. Skepticism is a general epistemological position, while being wrong is a particular, very unlucky, and usually only momentary epistemological state. Epistemological skepticism could be true while a subject might merely luckily be right or merely luckily have accurate justification. So, for example, if justification skepticism is true, every once in a while I might luckily believe something true or luckily have some justification. The thought, though, is that there's a deeper problem here with justification. So if epistemological skepticism about justification is true, that's not saying we're always wrong. It's saying that when we try to get justification for things, the justification breaks down. And similarly, and in the opposite direction, some subject might be wrong or have deceptive justification without epistemological skepticism being true. So, for example, let's just stipulate that epistemological skepticism is false Nonetheless, I might occasionally be wrong about something. I might think that I left my keys on the table when, in fact, they're in my jacket pocket. If I'm wrong occasionally, that doesn't show that epistemological skepticism is true. So think back to the clip from The Matrix. In The Matrix clip, Neo was very wrong about the way he took the world to be. And we might even further think that because he was so wrong, that shows us that some sort of knowledge skepticism about his time in the Matrix was true. But these are two separate things. You can be wrong without skepticism being true, or skepticism can be true and you just occasionally might be right. So what's the connection here between these two? Well, Descartes is going to argue that since we are sometimes or even often wrong with respect to certain sources of justification, that proves that skepticism looms large on the horizon for us. And there are two central arguments that Descartes gives, and I'll outline each one of those arguments for you. The first argument that Descartes gives is known as the dream argument for skepticism. So here's a quotation from Descartes. He says, But am I not a human being, and therefore in the habit of sleeping at night, when in my dreams I have all the same experiences as these madmen do when they are awake, or sometimes even stranger ones? How often my sleep at night has convinced me of all these familiar things that I was here, wrapped in my gown, sitting by the fire, when, in fact, I was lying naked under the bedclothes. All the same, I am now perceiving this paper with eyes that are certainly awake. The head I am nodding is not drowsy. I stretch out my hand and feel it knowingly and deliberately. A sleeper would not have these experiences so distinctly. But have I then forgotten those other occasions on which I have been deceived by similar thoughts in my dreams? When I think over this more carefully, 
I see so clearly that waking can never be distinguished from sleep by any conclusive indications that I am stupefied, and this very stupor comes close to persuading me that I am asleep after all. So think for a second. Are you asleep right now? Are you having a wonderful dream of listening to a lecture given by me on Descartes' first meditation? You might say, no, of course not. How would you know that, Descartes says? Wouldn't it seem exactly the same to you if you were asleep and having a dream as it would seem to you if you weren't asleep and if this were the actual world? Well, the thought is, if you can't know with certainty whether you're asleep or awake, then isn't that a very serious problem for your claims, even if you are awake, that you know things or that you're justified in believing things? It's not just that you could be wrong. We all recognize that. The thought is that there's nothing that could tell you that you're right or that you're not wrong. And if there's nothing that could tell you that, says Descartes, doesn't that show that there's a really big problem with you knowing anything at all? Now, Descartes has an initial response to the dream argument for skepticism, and that response looks something like this. Even if we are dreaming, we nonetheless still know a good number of things about the world. One of the things that we know is that the world contains, in general, the objects from our dream. Now, how do we know this? Well, says Descartes, the objects in our dream, even if they're not real, even if they're a little bizarre, are still derived from waking experience. Descartes thinks never in any of our dreams do we have some experience, do we think some object is real, some state of affairs is actual, where the object or the state of affairs isn't very similar to something that happened in waking life or that came from waking life. And if this is the case, well, even if we might be dreaming right now, we can still know that these sorts of objects exist. That's something we can be justified in believing. A second thing that we know is that the world is governed, governed in general by the laws governing our dreams. So think about a dream. In dreams, generally, gravity exists or cause and effect is a law. There's temporal relations, relationships of before and after, simultaneity. Spatial relations, relations of to the left of and to the right of. Now, sometimes we can do very strange things in our dreams, like fly, for example. But in general, the laws that govern our dreams are the exact same laws that govern the waking world. And he thinks that the process by which these laws get into our dreams is the same process by which the objects and states of affairs mentioned in one get into our dreams. We have imprints in our mind from experience, and when we fall asleep, our minds make use of these materials in our dreams. And third, all knowledge derived from rational intuition, for example, logical and mathematical knowledge, that knowledge that we have in our dreams is true. So even if you're dreaming right now, think, is 1 plus 1 equal to 2? Yes, you know that. Or if you only have two options and one of them is taken away, you're only left with the other of the two options. Well, that's mathematical knowledge. That's logical knowledge. If this is knowledge that you have in a dream, it's got to be knowledge that you can have in the waking world as well. So there are a bunch of things that you can know, even if you're currently having a dream, or even if you can't distinguish between whether this is a dream or the waking world. Well, says Descartes, should this give us good reason to reject justificational knowledge skepticism? No, because there's an even further argument 
for the truth of skepticism that takes away all three of the things we can know if all we're concerned about is that we're dreaming. This is the more famous argument of Descartes, and it's been uh, become known as the evil demon argument for skepticism. Here's a quotation from Descartes. He says, I will therefore suppose that not God, who's perfectly good and the source of truth, but some evil spirit, or what I'm calling an evil demon, supremely powerful and cunning, has devoted all his efforts to deceiving me. I will think that the sky, the air, the earth, colors, shapes, sounds, and all external things are no different from the illusions of our dreams, and that they are traps he, the evil demon, has laid for my credulity. I will consider myself as having no hands, no eyes, no flesh, no blood, and no senses, but yet as falsely believing that I have all these. I will obstinately cling to these thoughts, and in this way, if indeed it is not in my power to discover any truth, yet certainly to the best of my ability and determination, I will take care not to give my assent to anything false, or to allow this deceiver, however powerful and cunning he may be, to impose upon me in any way. Notice what Descartes is saying here. If you're being deceived by an evil demon, then nothing that seems true to you is justifiable. Nothing that seems true to you is actually knowledge. And if your goal is to believe true things, as Descartes' goal is, then you shouldn't believe anything. You're not justified in believing anything. You have knowledge of nothing. Now that's if your goal is to believe true things. And it would be strange to say that your goal is to believe false things. So if it's your goal to know, to be justified, and if it's possible that you're being deceived by an evil demon, then knowledge and justification, they disappear. Descartes is not saying that you are being deceived by an evil demon, or that you are dreaming. He's saying that since you can't rule out the possibility of deception by an evil demon, there's a problem. If you can't tell the difference between being deceived by an evil demon and not being deceived by an evil demon, you don't actually have any justification at all, nor do you have any knowledge at all. Now, this brings up something central to Descartes' argument, and it's the relation between justification, knowledge, and certainty. Descartes says, To all these arguments, the ones he's given, indeed, I have no answer, but at length I'm forced to admit that there is nothing of all those things I once thought true of which it is not legitimate to doubt and not out of any thoughtlessness or irresponsibility, but for sound and well-weighed reasons, and therefore that, from these things as well, no less than from what is blatantly false, I must now carefully withhold my assent if I wish to discover anything that is certain. What Descartes means here is that both justification and knowledge require certainty. Certainty that one is not being deceived or that one's justification or knowledge is veridical. And if you can't have certainty, says Descartes, then you need to withhold assent. Now, this seems entirely commonsensical. You should only believe the things that you can be certain of. If you can't be certain of something, well, you can't know it, and you can't be justified in knowing it. Now, one of the central projects of epistemology for the past couple hundred years has been to try to make sense of the worry that we are being radically deceived. How could we possibly know anything? How could we possibly be justified in believing anything if we could possibly be wrong about all of this? 
Now, I'm going to lay out four different, very, uh, four very different responses that have been given to the threat of skepticism. The first response is Descartes' own response, and it relies on a theistic picture or a picture where God exists and is related to humans and cares whether humans believe true things or false things. This response comes from the meditations, although it comes from one of the meditations that you didn't read. It's from the third meditation, and Descartes says, the whole force of the argument that he's given comes down to this, that I recognize that it cannot be that I should exist with the nature I possess, that is, having the idea of God within myself, unless in reality God also exists. The same God whose idea is within me, that is, the one who possesses all the perfections that I cannot comprehend but can, to some extent, apprehend in my thinking, and who is subject to no kind of deficiency. From this, it is sufficiently clear that he cannot be a deceiver. For all cunning and deception presuppose some shortcoming, as is plain by the natural light. Well, what is Descartes saying here? He's saying, look, it's clear to me that God must exist, and the sort of God that it's clear to me exists is the sort of God who wouldn't allow me to be deceived. Therefore, if God exists and wouldn't allow me to be deceived, then I can know that skepticism is false, and that generally, when things seem true to me, they are, and therefore, that I can have justification that things are a certain way, and that I can know that things are certain ways. Now this isn't, in this quotation that I've given you, this isn't all of Descartes' evidence for the truth that God exists. He gives uh, a number of different arguments in favor of the claim that God exists. However, as you may have noticed yourself, there's a problem here. Any argument that Descartes can give for the claim that God exists is going to rely on Descartes' ability to assess the truth or falsity of the claims made in the argument. But if Descartes is being deceived, then his ability to assess the truth or falsity of these claims is going to be compromised. Now, if Descartes isn't being deceived, then sure, his justification for the claim that God exists is veridical, tells him something that's true, and therefore he can know that God exists. But what's going on here is that Descartes is unfortunately reasoning in a circle. And this form of reasoning has been labeled, because of this, uh, this very argument, Descartes' circle, and the circular reasoning is that God uses his, uh, excuse me, Descartes uses his own knowledge or his own belief that God exists in order to prove that he's not being deceived, in order to prove that his knowledge that God exists is veridical. So we're going around in a circle here. Descartes thinks that he can show that if he clearly and distinctly believes that God exists, or thinks that God exists, that that shows that God exists, which shows that his clear and distinct idea that God exists is veridical. There's a problem. Now, if Descartes could have shown some way that's not subject to skepticism, that God exists, and that God wouldn't allow skepticism to be true, that would solve the problem for us. Unfortunately, the way that Descartes has set up skepticism is so forceful that we could be deceived about whether our belief that God exists is true or false. And notice that this isn't just a problem for God. Anything that we try to um, make the foundation of our knowledge is going to be subject to skepticism. And so we can never get outside of skepticism the way that Descartes has set it up. 
if we're concerned about being certain that we're not being deceived. Let's move on to David Hume. David Hume was uh, one of the Enlightenment contemporaries of Descartes, although he was a little bit after Descartes. And Hume's response is a response that doesn't so much try to defeat the truth of skepticism, but to defeat the implications of skepticism. Hume offers a pragmatic solution, an action-oriented solution to skepticism. Here's Hume. For here is the chief and most confounding objection to excessive skepticism, that no durable good can ever result from it, while it remains in its full force and vigor. We need only ask such a skeptic what his meaning is, and what he proposes by all these curious researches. He is immediately at a loss and knows not what to answer. On the contrary, he must acknowledge, if he will acknowledge anything, that all human life must perish were his principles universally and steadily to prevail. All discourse, all action would immediately cease, and men remain in a total lethargy till the necessities of nature, unsatisfied, put an end to their miserable existence. And though a skeptic may throw himself or others into a momentary amazement and confusion by his profound reasonings, the first and most trivial event in life will put to flight all his doubts and scruples and leave him the same in every point of action and speculation with the philosophers of every other sect. Hume's point here is that skepticism is not the sort of thing that someone can actually believe is true. If you believe that skepticism is true, well, not only are you going to have no justification for believing that skepticism is true, since, in order to get justification for the truth of skepticism, skepticism would have to be false, but even further, the second anything happens that demands your attention, someone calls your name, someone throws something to you that you need to catch, you need to figure out where you've put the food. You'll abandon, in a practical sense, skepticism. Now, there were ancient Greek philosophers known as the skeptics who said that they would withhold their assent to things in order to not get caught up in a search for certainty. That might be a sort of virtue, to not be so attached to our beliefs that we can't possibly function in the world without being dogmatic or ideological. Notice that Hume isn't attacking this sort of skeptic. Hume is attacking the sort of skeptic who would say, you can't know anything, you can't be justified in doing anything, therefore I guess I'm just going to sit around, not believe anything, not do anything. You can't, says Hume. Now this doesn't attack the truth of skepticism. Skepticism might as yet be true. What it attacks is the pragmatic implications of skepticism. Nobody can act like a skeptic, so don't even try. Now, you might not be all that impressed with Hume's response here, although it is a powerful response. Hume is changing the question. He doesn't want to talk about whether skepticism is true. What he wants to talk about is why it would matter at all whether skepticism is true. You have to live insofar as you've decide to, decided to stay alive. Of course, it's in your power not to be alive anymore. But if you're reading Hume, if you're listening to this lecture, you've decided for at least another day to stay alive, and you've got to do something about it. And since you have to feed yourself, you have to drink water, you have to avoid things that are coming towards your head. You can't believe that skepticism is true and continue to exist. Well, let's move on to a response that doesn't consider mere practical implications of skepticism, but actually tries to respond to the truth of skepticism. Fred Dretzky tried to respond to the truth of skepticism 
by claiming that Descartes was wrong about what we would need to rule out in order to know things or be justified in believing things. Recall that Descartes claimed that we needed to have certainty that we weren't being deceived in order to be justified in believing anything, in order to know anything at all. According to Dretzky, all we would need was to be able to rule out relevant alternatives to our being correct. Here's a quote from Dretzky. You take your son to the zoo, see several zebras, and when questioned by your son, you tell him that they're zebras. Do you know that they're zebras? Well, most of us would have little hesitation saying that we did know this. We know what zebras look like, and besides, this is the city zoo, and the animals are in a pen that's clearly marked zebras. Yet, something's being a zebra implies that it's not a mule, and in particular, not a mule that's been cleverly disguised by the zoo authorities to look like a zebra. Do you know that these animals are not mules cleverly disguised by the zoo authorities to look like zebras? Well, my word, you might say, no, I don't know that. I don't have any justification that they're not cleverly disguised mules, but being a cleverly disguised mule is not relevant to whether I know whether this thing is a zebra or not. Now, if I had some reason for thinking that uh, this was the sort of zoo, it was a cut-rate zoo that couldn't afford zebras and would dress up mules as zebras in order to try to get more admission um, fees from people, well, then I might have some reason to think that this isn't a zebra. And therefore, then, I might not know whether this is a zebra. It might be a cleverly disguised mule. But the fact that something is a mere possibility doesn't give it enough epistemic force to destroy my justification or knowledge. When Descartes brings up issues of whether you're being disguised, uh, whether you're being deceived by an evil demon, Dretzky would say what he's bringing up here are alternatives to what you believe, but he's not bringing up relevant alternatives. The mere possibility of something's being true does not make it powerful enough to destroy your knowledge. Now, this is a very powerful response. One thing you probably wonder is, well, what makes something a relevant alternative or not? You're going to have to have even further knowledge and belief and justification about what a relevant alternative is, and you might worry that you would end up arguing in a circle, although it would be a much bigger circle than the circle that Descartes was arguing in, but in order to figure these things out, wouldn't you need to have an internally consistent holistic system of belief and justification? And the answer is probably yes. Although, what's the alternative? Now, finally, you may have just been saying through this entire thing, my word, who would get themselves so caught up in all of this that they would be so worried? Well, of course, nobody was claiming here that you should just stop living, that you should solve all the epistemological questions, that these are things that are really going to threaten you. That's what Hume was showing us. But insofar as we're doing a technical investigation of knowledge, the nature of knowledge, what it is to know, what we can be justified in believing, etc., it seems like we need to get clear on what we can possibly know. Well, one person who responds to the threat of skepticism with something like what you may have been feeling this entire time is the philosopher G.E. Moore. Moore's epistemological position was aptly called common sense philosophy. And common sense philosophy says, look, you've got two alternatives here. Either you're justified in believing the things that you appear to be justified in believing, or some outlandish thing that destroys your justification is true. But you'd have to be justified in believing that, all, uh, that outlandish thing in order for you to come to the conclusion that you're not justified in believing what it seems like you're justified in believing. So we've got two alternatives. Pick the thing that's commonsensically true, or pick the thing that's 
ridiculous, commonsensically false. And why would you choose the latter over the former? Here's a quotation from Moore. I can now give a large number of different proofs, each of which is a perfectly rigorous proof, and that at many other times I have been in a position to give many others. I can prove now, for instance, that two human hands exist. How? By holding up my two hands and saying, as I make a certain gesture with the right hand, here's one hand, and adding, as I make a certain gesture with the left, and here's another. But did I prove just now that two human hands were in existence? I want to insist that I did, that the proof which I gave was a perfectly rigorous one, and that it is perhaps impossible to give a better or more rigorous proof of anything whatever. So notice Moore's move here. He's saying certainty is irrelevant to justification and knowledge. If you allow Descartes to set up the epistemological game, where certainty is the criterion of justification and knowledge, then we can never be justified in believing anything and all of our knowledge disappears. But nothing requires us to allow that to be the criterion of knowledge. We would need some good reason to allow that to be the criterion of knowledge. But any reason that we could give for trusting Descartes' skepticism would have to be more commonsensical than the fact that you have hands. And what could be more commonsensical than the fact that you have hands? Now, I don't think that you should be entirely convinced by any of these plausible responses that were given here. However, it does show that when we're considering justification, knowledge, how reality actually is, that we're not doomed by skepticism just because it's a possibility. Another thing that Descartes has shown us here, though, is that this distinction between justification and truth is an important one when we're doing epistemology, and we'll want to keep it in mind as we consider other philosophical problems. What's true is a different question from what are we justified in believing. And sometimes, sometimes what's true is just something that we can have no knowledge of. Sometimes we're wrong in our justification. The goal is, epistemologically, to do the best we can and to not hold ourselves to standards that are impossible. Thank you.